Thank you very much. Thank you. You don't know what I'm going to say yet, so wait for it. Thank you, Danny. Thank you to all of you for coming. I want to welcome you. I want to welcome you to this amazing building. One of the things we did at the beginning of the inquiry was make a commitment that we would only ever meet in civil society spaces. This is partly because I believe in keeping the money in civil society and not giving it to hotels and other places. But it's also because we wanted to honour the fantastic spaces that exist in civil society. This was a church hall. It was a library. I think it had a care home existence. It is now a very beautiful community centre in which I'm really pleased to welcome you with a focus on health. So if you get stressed, go downstairs and do some yoga. But I hope you'll stay with us for the day. Because what today is about is, yes, launching what we've discovered in this inquiry, and I want to talk about that. But it's also about celebrating civil society in all its forms. And the people in this room are not people who always go to every launch. They are people who've worked really hard to get us to the place we are. People who we've listened to really acutely. People from all across the country. And there's a map at the back there which makes me feel tired about the last 18 months because it shows just how many places we've been to and listened really acutely. So I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you for helping to shape what we've done. I want to thank the funders who had the vision and the courage to ask us to go out and independently explore what's happening, and I'll say something more about them in a moment. I want to thank the team who supported us, a collaboration of people from very different organisations, working in a networked and occasionally, I believe me, very scary way, because it's hard when organisations work together led by Louise Armstrong from Forum for the Future, but a big group of people, all of whom are here today. And a panel who came from very different perspectives, many of whom are with us today. A panel who brought different points of view, who challenged in different ways, who have different experience. And I particularly want to thank Bert Massey, who tragically died early on in the panel's meetings, but who made such a big impact not just on me, but on others who've never met him before, by his constant reminder that civil society is about rights and about resistance. It's about the bringing together of big institutions, movements and networks who challenge each other at all times to make social change happen. And Bert left us a legacy. When he was too ill to come to panel meetings, he'd phone me up to tell me what I ought to be doing. And I honour him for that. Those of you who knew him know exactly what I mean by that. We launched this panel in an extraordinary time and we report on our findings in another extraordinary time. I stood up a year last April at the NCVO conference and launched the inquiry. We just had a general election called that week, a surprise general election, so there was no minister. I had longer to speak than expected. The minister was pulled. We're now launching it when everybody is exercised about Brexit. But in a time of huge change, that's when civil society is at its best. And what we have witnessed over the last 18 months is the wonder of civil society, the creativity, the changes, the new organisations that are around. We've witnessed things that I expected to see. Of course I know there is austerity and it is haunting the country. Of course I know that governance changes are making mayors much more important than they ever have been before. Of course we know a lot of that's going on. But we also saw some other things in civil society. And that's what I want to talk about. Because what we were asked to do was look to the future. Not report on what's happening now, but look ten years out. Bill Gates memorably once said, or it stayed with me anyway, people always overestimate the change that happens in one year or two years. They completely underestimate the change that takes place in 10 years. Just think back 10 years. Most of us couldn't spell austerity. We knew about cuts, but we didn't call it austerity. I guarantee 10 years ago you didn't all have working computers in your pockets, but I suspect you do now. Twitter and Facebook were embryonic ideas, and food banks had never been heard of in 2010. Look back and see how much has changed. So my mantra in the last 18 months has been when the world is changing fast and you're asked to look to the future, look very closely at what's happening now. 
Look at the margins and look how things are changing, because that will give you the best route map into the future. And we have found things that I think will be of no surprise to anyone in this room. The development of new sorts of networks and movements, challenging established organisations, supporting established organisations, established organisations changing what they do. We found all of that in every part of the country. We found rich, deep civil society, the glue that holds us together, the glue that carries on making society function when our ministers are a bit otherwise engaged and our businesses are exiting the high street in a way that I couldn't have imagined seeing in the last 18 months. When the organisations that go very rapidly from our towns and villages disappear, civil society stays on. And so I think we're right to celebrate today. And in launching this report, I'm launching a report, but I'm also launching the amazing creative posters that are around here that were commissioned as part of this. I'm launching the films that you're going to see later on, the immersive theater, the food, all of this that comes from civil society. We're launching this because it's a celebration, not just of what civil society does now, but what it can do in the future. But we are also launching three reports, because, hey, you couldn't come to an event without some bits of paper. And they are beautiful, and they look wonderful, and they do celebrate civil society, as well as challenging it. We have a report that has deep, rich research in it. Deep dives in nine communities. Nearly 70 responses to a call for inquiry. Conversations all over the country. You will hear people say it's only about communities. This has come from all over the country. All sorts of parts of the organisations have been involved. We have a report, I keep calling a summary, but it's nearly as long as the main report because it has so much in it, which talks about the big trends, the trends that are changing our world, and that unless we get our heads around them, we will carry on living in the past. And we're, we're launching this, which will be properly published by next week, very dear to my heart, because one of the issues that emerged, and I'll talk about in a moment, is our difficulty in talking about racism, the scar across our society. And I'm incredibly proud that the third document, which is available online and is a really good read and will be published in hard copy next week, Let's Talk About Race, which my colleague from the panel, Asifa Fridi, led big and complex and challenging discussions, challenging for all of us. Those three documents, together with the banners, together with the films, together with the voices of young people, tell us something about where we need to go. Because what did we find? We found the good, the incredible vibrancy of civil society, the connections that are going on, the activity in localities without which the state, the police force, our local hospitals would simply not function. Don't let anyone tell you we're dependent on the state. The state is massively dependent on civil society. We found the good. We found the bad. We found people overtired, stressed, incredibly worried about the future of what they're doing, feeling ignored, feeling overlooked. And we frankly found the ugly too. We found people who felt that the funding they were getting was too often tied to the funders' priorities, not the people's priorities. We found people who felt they were running to keep up with demands from others rather than serving their communities. We found organisations that were nervous and scared about talking about the deep divides in our society. And it is to address those big challenges that we have come up with our proposal for a new way of behaving in civil society. I've been challenged since I started this. Aren't you really talking about two bits of the world? You're talking about community organisations, you're talking about big charities. Shouldn't we split them? Emphatically, no. Emphatically, what we have learned in this inquiry is, is the interrelationship between those movements and networks, those challenger organisations, those long established community groups who've been in their community for decades, who know stuff that no government minister will ever know and the established charities, big and small. It is that rich network, all formed, not because people wanted the status, Lord knows there's not a lot of that, not because they wanted the money, not because government told them to do it, but because they wanted to make a difference. That impulse that's driven every organisation in civil society is what holds us together. But we're not as good as we should be. 
We are not working together as well as we should be. Too often we are as divided as the society in which we operate. There are divisions within civil society between those who have money and those who don't. Between those who work in distant towns far from London and those working in the big cities. There are differences between those working on causes which command massive public attention and support and those working on those vitally important unpopular causes. Looking at someone who spent her life on homelessness, refugees and poverty. You know, there are issues which are hard to get on the public radar. There are divisions within our society, within civil society, and they mirror those in the bigger society. And they are dangerous for our purpose. They will stop us thriving. They will stop us making the difference that we need to make in the next decade. Because the next decade, whichever meta trend you look at, is going to be more volatile than the last. In the 18 months of this inquiry, we've not just seen governments change and wobble and different things happen in Brussels and exciting things like that. We have been shocked and rocked to our core as a society by a number of things that have happened. By the Me Too movement and how women using a hashtag organised around harassment. By the tragedy of Grenfell Tower where those residents had already complained and complained and reported on the dangers they were living in. By the Windrush scandal, which brought down a Home Secretary, ruined lives, and yet was known about since 2014, because guess what? Civil society organisations knew what was happening. By the child sexual exploitation scandals that have rocked some of the northern towns and made politics there really difficult, as well as ruining the lives of huge numbers of young women. All those things and many more. Oh yes, the universal credit scandal. Who knew? We needed someone from the UN to come and tell us. It wasn't working. Organisations across civil society have known for a long time, but we haven't spoken with the voice that could be heard. All of those things have happened and many more in the 18 months that we've been looking really acutely at what's happening to civil society and is it fit for purpose? And I'm going to conclude by saying we have fantastic energy, we have resource, we have connections in civil society, but we don't always work together as well as we should. Now, we stand on the shoulders of giants in this. 18 years ago, Nick Deakin did an incredibly important report about the future of what we then called the voluntary sector. We've broadened our definition since. And he instituted a compact, a compact between government and the voluntary sector. And for those of you who've been around as long as I have, we know that was an incredibly important moment. It gave us a new set of rules. We're saying now is the time for us to have our own agreement, our own agreement within civil society about how we will behave and how we will behave to each other. And we've called it the pact, not the compact, the pact. We've called it the pact because we think that there are changes that are fundamental in the behaviour of all of us in civil society, in our relationships across civil society, that if we attend to them, will make us fit for the future. And I'm going to start with a T just to confuse you. I want to start talking about trust. I know there are a lot of Twitter warriors, Carl, I'm looking at you, who every time anyone talks about trust, say, no, no, the public do trust charities, and the public do trust charities by and large. You're right, the data shows it. I'm not sure we trust each other. I'm not sure that the community organisations I have met trust the bigger organisations to protect them and have their back. I'm not sure that some of the bigger organisations that I know well and love, and indeed I ran one, trust people in the movements and networks who are often angry and don't follow the rules and break the law all the time and do really tricky things. I don't think we have a huge amount of trust within civil society. We will always come from different perspectives. There will always be people in every village who want to protect the village green and they fight for that right, and people who want to build housing for young people and will fight for that. That's civil society. It's messy. But we need to trust each other and be able to work together. And building trust takes time. It's messy. It's complicated. But trust is our currency. Most of you in this room don't have very big balance sheets. Believe me, the trust people have in you and the trust that you can use is much more valuable than that balance sheet. But how we trust each other is the first thing that I think we need to radically address. I think if we don't, we will be further divided and that will be more dangerous. And the reason trust matters so much 
is because the enduring purpose of civil society to build deep connections in our communities with the people we support. Deep human connections, not, as somebody said to me recently, Facebook likes. That's lovely, fine, go and do it. But the deep human connections between and within organisations really matters. So the second word is C for connections. The third is about accountability. I've run a big organisation. I know how very easy it is to feel accountable to people who give you money, to people who seem to know what they're saying, to what the chatter is in the newspapers, to government ministers. Our real accountability must always be to each other, to the organisations we work with, and to our beneficiaries. We have had scandals over the last 10 years in our sector. And after every one, I've heard people knowingly say, we knew that was going to happen. When will be the time when we hold each other to a decent stand of accountability? When will we start saying, actually, somebody damaging what's happening in civil society is damaging us all. It is not enough to be unaccountable and to say, we always knew that was going to go horribly wrong, but we kept quiet about it. It's not good enough for the people we serve. It's not good enough for the whole of civil society. And all of that takes me to the question of power. Power is a really uncomfortable term. But community organisations, networks, movements, voluntary organisations have massive power. They bring together people who are angry about something, who care about something, people who have a view to express. What a powerful thing to have. We need to understand that power and use it properly. We need to honour the power people have, recognise that if you are a group of parents campaigning for your child with learning disabilities, you have power that the rest of civil society needs to listen to very carefully. That we need to recognise where power is, shift power to where the knowledge is, shift it to where those deep connections are. And that's why we're talking about a pact. A pact where we all commit to different behaviours, different attitudes, different practices. Now I know, because I know there are critics around and I'm not so silly as not to read what they say. I know there's a view that these reports don't have enough recommendations for government. Well, believe me, I know how to write reports that government will read. I could have done that 18 months ago. I could have written a list of recommendations with nice bullet points and indentations. I could, I think, I know, have got meetings with ministers and felt very good about it. Actually, what I've learned in the last 18 months is it's our behaviour that needs to change. Policy recommendations will come. There will be changes in government. But when our behaviour and our attitudes in civil society change, when we start understanding our power and speaking with clarity, when we hold each other to account, when we're deeply connected to our beneficiaries and to each other, when we're building trust, every minister, every mayor, every local authority leader will want to talk to us. Because the second thing I've heard is people saying civil society does not exist in a vacuum. No, of course it doesn't. Civil society is part of wider society. But local authorities are deeply dependent on what's happening in civil society. Just as the economy and the market is deeply dependent on government, so government is dependent on us. Let's not forget our power in that situation. Let's remember that at our very best and over hundreds of years, we have changed society by responding, responding with real certainty and conviction to what's going on. And we've done it by using our money, our shared money, because we have money in this sector, our resources, our skills and our ability, really profoundly to drive that change. I don't believe civil society exists on its own. I do believe that if civil society can't step up to this challenge, the rest of society, and that's all of us and our children and grandchildren, face a very bleak, rather disconnected, less human future. And that's why I think it really matters that now is the time to get our own acts together, to start making the changes we need to make. Because everybody we've met has told us that, yeah, government is an irritant. Yeah, if the local authority behaved differently, things would be better. But nobody has said to us, if only, if only that bit of legislation changed, everything would be okay. What they've told us is it's how we behave that makes a difference. 
So this is a profoundly significant piece of work. I think it tells us a lot about who we are and where we're going. It tells us a lot about the risks ahead, but it also says that how we behave puts the future in our hands and gives us some control. And I want to end on a personal note. I've worked in and around civil society for 40 years, which is a very long time. I've been chief executive of a big and powerful organisation. Lord knows, I've been a charity commissioner. You know, I've done the jobs. I know what this sector is like. I thought I knew what I'd find in this inquiry. I was wrong. I've discovered things that I didn't know about. And I think when I said, and we launched it, this inquiry will be, proceed with humility, but with boldness. I think we've done it in a humble way. We've gone out, we've learned, and we've listened. We've gone to places, frankly, quite a lot of people don't often go, although the people who live there know exactly what's going on there. And we've listened very acutely. And I've learned things about where power is in our society and where change is possible. And I know that the new generation of leaders, the next generation coming up, are so skilled, so creative, and so capable of taking this on, that those of us who've been in civil society a long time need to create some space for them and to make it really clear that if we're serious about that shift in power, we need to welcome them to the stage. At which point I ask Rhiannon, who is a Nesta, what are you called? I can it's a new radical from Leicester, but also a very active member of the panel to introduce some of the young people. Thank you very much. Enjoy the day.